That is the music that says it's free speech Fridays. It's time to wrap up the week with some people who don't mind speaking their minds. Uh, and we've got lots, lots on the agenda uh, today. We've had a huge week here at the platform, but it's been a big week in news. And I tried to pick two people I thought would have interesting, pertinent perspectives on the issues of the week. So, who we got? We've got Judith Collins MP, the National Member for Papakura, and I believe the, the National Party spokesperson on Science and Technology. Judith, is that right? Correct, yes, yep. thank you, and, and quite a few other things too. Um, but anyway, good morning, Sean. Good morning, Jonathan. Okay, and Jonathan Ailing from the Free Speech Union, and uh, we've got to get them both up at the same time, guys. We've got that. Um, Jonathan Ailing, who oh, we, we've had, we have, we've had a bit of a spat, haven't we, Jonathan? Defining whether or not Tusi Ata RV is poem, whether I'm trying to shut it down or just say I don't like paying for it. Well, that's right, Sean. You know, I think a, a spat is one way to look at it, but uh, differences amongst friends. Uh, we, we go, look, uh, she should have her right to speech like everyone else, disgusting as it is. And I think, not to not jump in here too early, but um, you have had a very classy response uh, over the past 48 hours with, with your poem. That's the exact sort of commentary we need to see uh, when we have really uh, low... Uh, sorts of, of, of speech that, that are, are really, really vile. I don't think we want to set that as the standard for incitement to violence, but uh, your commentary really points at them, points at the hypocrisy, and I think really that's the key issue here and makes us laugh, and I think that was a really classy way to deal with it. All right, well, classy or not, it's still a problem, and developments today and yesterday on this issue, I think, Judith really ask some difficult and provocative questions about society. And, and the problem that I've got is Tusiata Avia has wrote a poem that I think by any common parlance is hateful and does uh, technically inspire people to commit horrible uh, acts of violence against a specific group of people. But it's art and it's freedom of speech. Nobby Clark, the Mayor of Invercargill, and the, and I also have to point out, and the Human Rights Commission and the Race Relations Commission of Ming Foon say nothing. They say nothing about that poem uh, of any consequence. They don't pass judgment on it. Nobby Clark, the mayor of Invercargill, Judith, tries to discuss that in context and to engender some interest. He uses some words that are not widely acceptable. And suddenly Ming Foon arises from his slumber and tells Nobby Clark to pull his, his head in. Judith, is it fair to say that racism only officially runs one way in this country? Well, there is certainly a view uh, taken by people who say that it is impossible for anyone who is non-whitely racist, which is itself a totally racist comment, in my opinion, um, because you know, if you look at history, you can look at almost every uh, ethnic group, every uh, empire has had racist elements in it as part of their creed. If you consider it's not only white people who or sometimes think that they're superior because of their colour, um, but there are also other people who speak exactly the same about themselves. I think, you know, you look at, uh, if you look at World War Two, you know, look at the, the history of Japan's imperialism, for instance. So, you know, it, it is, just shows a total naivety, un, no understanding of history, no understanding of historical context. And I think what we're seeing with Ming Foon and is that he is someone who what seems to be a very competent mayor of Gisborne, and that might be a good place. For him to say, yeah, you say he's beyond his competence as race relations consultant. I most, might also add yeah. the the diving, ducking, and weaving of the Human Rights Commission is run largely, it would seem to me, by Paul Hunt. Yes. Well, again, look, these are people who the government has appointed and, you know, we, we don't go after them and attack them too much, reason like that, because obviously they're doing what the government expected them to do. And Paul Hunt was another unusual appointment, I think much more unusual than Ming Foon, um, having almost a very little background in New Zealand and most of his time he seems to be very focused on on Middle East um, and issues there. So, look, I, I just think we, we understand the Ardern government, which Chris Sipkins was a major part of, was involved in putting in people that they thought would 
be the right people for what they wanted. Yeah. Jonathan, you've met Paul Hunt. What do you make of him? Look, I think um, consistent across the issues here, as I said before, is really a question of hypocrisy. Uh, what's what's good for the goose in our country needs to be good for the gander. And, and just more and more uh, everyday Kiwis are aware that that's not the case. And, and I, I think uh, it, it's blatantly clear that we, we have these appointments that are pushing uh, ideological genders at, at the cost of not doing their jobs and so we have been we've been quite vocal uh, with our criticism of the human rights commission saying free speech underpins a free belief and free conscience and this is the foundation of our human rights framework in uh, you know our, our sense of a liberal democratic society and they have been openly advocating to limit the free speech of kiwis and that is in total contradiction of what their role is and now now we see here silence on, on what we all three would agree uh, what was pretty disgusting speech uh, in the poem and then as soon as commentary about the poem comes out from from a an older white haired male uh, near then they pounce and so i think people look at this and go hang on a second why aren't I getting any cover from these people? And that's going to breed real resentment. So that's the problem I think we're dealing with here. I have to be honest, guys. The other problem is the mainstream media because they weren't interested in the Tusiata Tavia, uh, Avia story and the silence of the Human Rights Commission and the fact that they have no ignored nearly 100 complaints and on the eve of the performance of that poem, they basically wrote a letter blowing off everyone who was concerned about it. But suddenly they're interested in the story when they can attack and get Ming Foon to attack a, a white old guy who's mayor of Invercargill. And to be honest, they took an interview that um, Michael Laws did on the platform with them yesterday, put it into their own news coverage and didn't credit us. That's a minor political um, uh, issue to deal with or, or professional issue to deal with. But this narrative, this hypocrisy and narrative, Judith, is being driven by the attitude of our legacy media. Well, I think that if you go back to the fact that um, there is that public, what is it called, the public funding of media or something like that? If you have public a interest that journalism classes, fund. That's the one. If you go and have a look at it, which I have done, it is very clear that Labour have set out a particular agenda. And they did this, obviously, because, and the media took that money and that if they don't sign up to it, they don't do what they're supposed to do. It, they can't get that money. And so, of course, it's created a massive conflict for them as well. And and I think, you know, you will find that some mainstream media will stand up, but uh, they then can end up being vilified by a um, bureaucracy. Or, in fact, that, having to give the money back is what the contract says, Judith. If you break the rules, you have to give the money back in perpetuity. Yeah. I mean, how, how can that even be acceptable in a liberal democracy? I mean, it's just insane, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Well, let's, and I'm just trying to figure how we segue this. Okay, let's move on to the other issue that we broke yesterday. Oh. The news that real estate agents, as part of the, the 16,600 real estate agents in the country, that's way too many, um, th those people do 10 hours of retraining every year um, this year, one and a half hours of that is going to be training on the Tariti of Waitangi. I have not met a real estate agent yet who can see why they have to do that. Is this just another example, Judith, of sort of wokeism permeating every aspect of New Zealand society? Well, I've got to say, it's, it's unusual. You, you wouldn't normally think that real estate agents would need to be proficient in the Treaty of Waitangi. But... I can understand that people might want to avail themselves of that information and knowledge. So give them the I option. I think the real estate agents, well, the 16,600 real estate agents you, you just quoted, if they are concerned at the quality of their continued professional development courses, then what they need to do is to take it up with the people that they are paying, which is their own um, organisation. Yeah. And so that's where they should go. I mean, I'm I'm not going to go and take up the cudgels for somebody who doesn't want to do it themselves because ultimately they're 16,600 people. And I don't see anything wrong with learning about the Treaty of Waitangi. Even if it's, it's government mandated. It's government mandated well, by the real estate it, a, 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 a authority. 
Well, I just I think that it ends up becoming uh, somewhat um, counterproductive if you keep forcing people to do things. And I think what we're seeing, it's like what we're seeing with various other things, you end up with a backlash. So I'd say real estate agents, if you don't like to want to spend one and a half hours of your continued professional development of the 10, 10 hours you've got doing that, you should take it up with your agency right. and you should let them know what your thoughts are. All right, Jonathan, Amy. Want, if, yeah? if, let me jump in there because I, I think Judith is, is bang on the money there in terms of people actually need to take responsibility to use their voice to stand up in the industry where they feel that you know they're being pushed around or, or, or told to learn things that they have no interest in learning. But, but I have two questions really to uh, whether this is going to be valuable or not. First of all, are we going to address a housing crisis in any way? Are we going to be able to get more value out of our real estate uh, providers in any way by this information being taught? And, and, and there may be a case for that, but make the case. Show how this is valuable to, to society as a whole and to the individuals working in this industry, not just push it down from the top. And the second question is, are we only going to have one interpretation of the treaty board? Or is there an opportunity... Well, my, my to point is that quite clearly the idea is that we do only have one interpretation. It's the government's interpretation. And that is why that providing is the, 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 this information is uh, normal real estate trainers are not allowed to do this. The real estate authority has decided that's culturally insensitive and it's going to be a wānanga, a polytechnic in Tauranga that is given the sole responsibility for developing this. They are a government organisation. That, that's where the sinister element comes in. And Judith is talking about a backlash where people are being, where this is being pushed down on people. And I say it, it stems a backlash as well. When you're told there's only one way of thinking, there's only one way of seeing this issue, when everyone knows, hang on a second, there are some very credible commentators who view this in a different light. Why don't we hear them have their say? And then I'll get to decide, which I think is... Uh, a competing perspective and, and which way we should go. And I think when we have effectively a propaganda being pushed down because only one way on any issue can be seen, that is stemming a problem for the future. All right. Um, okay, we've dealt with that. Let's move on to the other one, the story we've been pushing and finally getting traction on this week. Ian Wishart has done a number of bits of investigation and in this... Look, Cyclone Gabriel, I'm sure we all agree, was terrible. 11 people dead and massive property damage and infrastructure damage and a real, I mean, a huge impact on New Zealand as a whole uh, and certainly on the people in the regions affected. In the wake of and during Cyclone Gabriel and the previous uh, rain event in Auckland, suddenly the narrative was this is the reality of climate change, this is why we have to drive towards zero carbon, stop eating meat, kill all dairy farmers, drive a Tesla. Um, and that narrative driven once again by mainstream media and outfits like NIWA. In fact, NIWA led the charge on this. This is a, you know, this can be connected to climate change. Ian Nushart's done some amazing analysis that tells us that it was not a climate change induced event. It was not the most severe storm in, in New Zealand. It's the sort of storm that actually happens one or 10 years and we were, were either not reporting or by mistake or willfully not having accurate records on severe storms in New Zealand. They changed the goalpost yesterday, said, oh, it's the wettest storm in New Zealand, and goes and does some research, and that isn't true either. Uh, guys, do we have to be careful that the new religion of climate change doesn't make us report assumptions and accept assumptions that are not scientifically true, Judith? I think it's um, very important that everyone sort of calms down on things and understands that, you know, yes, climate change is happening. Yes, uh, obviously that is a very serious thing that we need to adapt to as well as to um, bring down emissions. But there have been storms before. There have been catastrophic storms before. And a lot of the problem that we've seen in Hawke's Bay and in the Poverty Bay region, Tairafti region, is, of course, around the slash, forest slash, mm. and what's been happening there. So it is very difficult to build bridges, for instance, that are going to withstand uh, logs coming 
at those bridges at yeah. you know, a million miles an hour and, and loads of them. So just, let's just be realistic on it. But at the same time, climate change is a real thing. It is very important. As When it comes to the information about what NEWA has and what it's reported, I'm going to be asking some questions of the Minister on this. And the reason I'm asking those questions is she is also the same Minister who is the Minister of Health. And as we know, there have been, it's been found out by my colleague, Dr. Shade Mitty, some very dodgy figures put out by the Ministry of Health, um, or Health NZ, whatever they're called now. And it is really important that we don't have that sort of um, lack of confidence in the figures provided. I understand that communications people in various organisations, including CRIs, um, want to be able to be leading the news on various things, but it is important that we get facts exactly right. So we're putting in some written questions on that, and I think it's really important that we get the real, you know, we ask and we find out what it is that the story actually is. Mm. Yeah, Jonathan, uh, are you kind of... Uh, I think what, what happens is that we get into this kind of feedback loop and if you base that feedback on bad data or untrue data, we are never going to solve the problems of forestry slash if we think we directly link Gabriel to climate change. It was not a climate change event. It was a weather event. And increasingly, records and research suggest not a particularly severe one, but maybe made severe because of the slash in, in the rivers and some bad infrastructure. We're not going to solve the, uh, the challenges related to climate change, but we're not going to solve the challenges related to any complex issue if we don't let people come to the table, ask the questions, put forward their hypothesis, and let the debate flow from there. If we start with a prescribed answer on any complex issue, then we're actually setting ourselves up for a fail. And so I think Judith comments there are right. We need to be allowed to ask the questions and expect the, the, the facts to speak for themselves. So I, I would note... Be careful uh, when you ask those questions, Judith, because I think um, Christopher Luxon may have an issue with some questions being asked around climate change. I think Maureen Pugh struggled with that recently herself. Oh, no. So oh, no, come on. I think it's a fair point Jonathan makes. Can you speak to that, Judith? It would seem to me that yes, I... climate change scepticism is banned inside the National Party caucus. It is really clear is that climate change is a real thing. And the thing is that... Because Maureen uh, just, just simply didn't have the information in front of her. She's now got the information. She is very aware of the effects of climate change. But uh, I think when we're looking at... She was like basically change, saying effect, what Ian Wishart has proved, is that Gabriel wasn't a climate change event. It was a weather event. Well, <laughs> I think we also need to look at the fact that when you have things like the forestry slash and you look yep. at what's been happening as well, and then you have climate change, and then you have weather events. Mm. It was a, that awful term, perfect storm, the, you know, the most awful storm for the people involved. Yeah. All right. All right. So, Jonathan, you were saying, though, that you think that, that Luxon's been a bit woke on climate change. Well, well, I think more than anything, Sean, it goes back to the point you made earlier where actually the media storm tried to whip up a witch trial. Uh, I, which hunt I, it is. I think... Uh, which hunt, rather, you're right. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and, and I, I think, you know, uh, as you said, there is very credible evidence. I, I don't know where the elite hysteria comes from people being worried about what I think is demonstrably true somehow being put the worst by misinformation or disinformation. I think we should have confidence in, in, in science and facts being able to stand up to, uh, to, to conspiracy theories and showing them off. But what I don't think is appropriate is when someone raises a question for the question itself to then become to a be reason. ruled out of order, just dump on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well said. Well, I, I think you also need to say that when you are running a political party, which I have, um, it is very important that, like with any business, any enterprise, is that loyalty so important, isn't it, Judith? Speak. Well, it's not only loyalty; it's understanding that there is a position which has been come to by people who have read the issues, have looked at the science, and they have come to that, that decision. So that's the way it is. I mean, it's like 
any organisation. I'm sure, you know, you, in your organisation and in any business, you need to be able to have people who are actually working uh, to the agreed position. Otherwise, everybody would be off on their own little tangents. Yeah. I think that's a very fair comment, uh, Judith. We, we, we do have a whipped party structure in New Zealand, and, and that's not entirely inappropriate and entirely censorous. And so that's why the free speech union didn't get into that tussle. But I think it does uh, draw into question uh, the, the uh, willingness more generally uh, for people to raise questions about this issue and others. And I think people are more and more inclined to go, hang on a second, Am I allowed to ask a question on this? Am I allowed to have a different perspective on this on a whole host of issues? And more and more Kiwis are finding out that they're not. And so I think this illustrated that. But you're right. In this particular context, there is a, there is a reason yeah. for Maureen to, to be told to pull ahead in a bit. All right. All right, guys. I want to move on to our last topic. Um, as I predicted a couple of weeks ago, uh, Rob Campbell has done um, the great Monty Python thing no arms, no legs, come back here, I'll bite your kneecaps off. He's gone from his jobs, but we've had the, the most remarkable... <laughs> do you like that imagery, Judith? Yeah, I do. I love... I mean, I'm so into, you know, anything Monty Python. And yeah. there's a certain generation that it, we, we understand it, and the younger ones have no idea. Yeah, well, my, my favourite Monty Python, actually, is Life of Brian. Red, you can't yeah, be no, a woman, yeah. you don't have ovaries yeah, in the no. uterus. Um, <laughs> um, okay, okay, that's an aside. Um, he's gone, but Steve Mahari, who's clearly a terrible writer because no one reads his politicised anti-national columns, he then says, oh, me too, I've been politically biased too. He's chair of the ACC and he's the chair of Pharmac. He says, oh, here's my resignation. And for some reason, the rules that they apply to Rob Campbell suddenly don't apply to Steve Mahari. And then we've got Ruth Dyson, who has some minor government sinecure, says, I don't even know about the political neutrality rules. And I know, Jonathan, you believe in freedom of speech, but when these people take these jobs, they willingly and knowingly, unless you're Ruth Dyson and can't be asked reading the small print, you say, I'm not going to be political. You say, I know that my freedom of speech is affected by taking this role. Judith, how can the government justify keeping Mahari in that role? There's no justification other than that he's a mentor and former boss of Chris Hipkins. Um, and he would say, well, look, Dodo, he, he fessed up and he said sorry and he won't do it again. Too late. He's been in that role now for years. Who knows what else has been going on? And then there's the other issue is that Mahari was, as I recall, Minister of State Services at one stage. If anybody knows what the rules are, he should. The fact well, we, is had, we, is had, we had Christine Rankin on yesterday and said, here's the guy oh, who basically yeah. didn't rehire me because he didn't like the way I dressed. Exactly. If you go back to some of the quotes that he made at the time, I think it was about 2001, where he started talking about her clothes and, and whether or not they were appropriate well, what the hell was that all about? And the answer was utter blatant sexism and his involvement as someone who was totally inappropriate comments from him. If that had been a national minister, I would hope that they would be tarred and feathered. And in his case, he, it was, he just blithely went along through. Yeah. Jonathan, what do you think? Double standard, Rob Campbell burnt at the stake, though he seemed to enjoy going down in flames. Um, but Mahari, oh, I'm sorry, Rip Dyson, I don't even know what the rules are. I'll be political if I want to. How, how can we say that's consistent? Well, there's no way to say it is consistent, and that's the problem across each of the issues that we've discussed today. Again, I'm just going to say that the, the hypocrisy keeps flowing, and it seems we're making it up on the go, and that gives no confidence to everyday Kiwis, whether they be white, black, or blue as to how the government or how our uh, the you know the institutions of our society are going to govern and you know sean you and i uh, have discussed before i grew up in mozambique i grew up in a post-marxist society that had had no reference to to free speech or to the uh, ideals that we embrace in the de democratic society and it is very very important that uh, an incoming government has confidence in the state sector and so whether it's whether it's chris hipkins and a new cabinet in october or whether it's a change of government 
We need those that sit around uh, the, the beehive uh, making decisions on this to actually be able to have confidence in the state service. And neutrality is an important part of that. Once we have uh, th these institutions co-opted by one political ideology or the other, then we'll have to have <laughs> a, a, a new sweep every time the government changes and, uh, and, and Kiwis will suffer because of that. So, look, when, when you're on the pay that these uh, chairmen are on uh, and, and when, when you have the responsibilities that you do, there is a give and take of... of uh, certain commentary rights then and and I think they were well aware of that or they at least should have been well aware of that when they came to the role. Unfortunately guys that is all we have got time for can I say I got a lot of text reaction to what you were both saying some good some bad but at least we are engaged. Uh, Judah thank you so much for joining us. Jonathan lovely to thank talk you. to you again we'll have you both back soon.